City Cast from Explicity. Ma'am, are you okay? Phoebe's mind dragged like treacle. Now, what was his name? I picked you up from the airport, taxi driver prompted. Uh, yes? He held up a bottle. I brought this back. Figured you might need it. It was Jojo's bottle, which she had dropped in the cab the night before. She had other more important things bothering her since arrival, and she had not thought about the bottle at all. Seeing the Avant logo on the bottle and the half-drunk water brought an instant of nostalgia, even sadness, as though it was lost years ago. Thank you, thank you so much, she said, wondering if the gratitude seemed forced. It was remarkable that anything she had lost was being returned. You're welcome. Well, see you around. He was about to turn around. Hey, hang on. His head cocked. He waited. I don't know if you... Did you... She found it hard to say without appearing insolent. Finally, she blurted out. You didn't find anything else in your cab? No. The bottle rolled under the seat. I only saw it today, sorry. What are you missing? I... Well, my bag. Your bag? Lady, ain't nothing else left in the cab. You lost your bag? You mean the one you were carrying by hand from the airport? Yep. He waited. She paused. There was no harm in telling him now. She might even be doing him a favor by warning him about this neighborhood. I was burgled last night. Oh, jeez. No, I... Sorry to hear that. Oh, what happened? He looked alarmed. They broke in. The locks are shit. Her voice was rising, becoming shrill and abrupt. I want to change the locks, but I'm waiting for Carter to get here. Carter? My... My boyfriend. She stuttered. Okay, she did say friend before, but now she did not care what the cab driver thought. When you picked up the keys, was it secure? Do you know the guys at Sun and Fun? Of course. He nodded and shook his head at the same time. Sure that he was. It's a family agency for maintaining vacation properties. Yeah, sure. I understand. She replied wearily, but could see he was not impressed. His jaw was set and his mood had completely darkened before he left. She did not try to convince him that she was not insinuating anything. She watched TV with Jojo for a few minutes after the cab driver left, sipping the lemonade she bought earlier. She glanced at her watch, her phone still charging. When she switched it on, there was a text from Carter, burying her forehead and eyes in her hands. She temporarily shielded herself from any more bad news. In an essay published in a 1964 edition of the Times Literary Supplement, Naipaul wrote, The language was ours to use as we pleased. The literature that came with it was therefore of peculiar authority, but this literature was like an alien mythology. There was, for instance, Wordsworth's notorious poem about the daffodil. A pretty little flower, no doubt, but we'd never seen it. Could the poem have any meaning for us? Naipaul was speaking of the irrelevance of English language education that had been bottled in the UK and served up to the colonies. His poignant observations capture the sentiments felt by writers of post-colonial literature when they were confronted with the British literary canon as their window to a world view. What Naipaul said defines almost every writer from the former colonies, like Naipaul and, say, Rushdie, hailing from countries once under the British Empire, including India, the Indian subcontinent, Kenya, Malaysia, Singapore, that ilk. And that's what we call post-colonial literature. 
These colonies share an educational system and even a curriculum steeped in the classics of British literature, works by luminaries like Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, the romantic poets, Wordsworth, uh, Coleridge, Shelley, Keats, were all a part of our learning experience. And that's how daffodils came into our ken, and like Naipaul said, most of us had never seen one, leave alone 10,000 at a glance. In the wake of the war and independence for these colonies, literature found a new expression. Post-colonial literature came to be characterized by this profound exploration of identity and experiences and cultural perspectives, and writers began to create narratives that reflected their unique experiences. Naipaul and his ilk were the Yogis, but after all these years, the albatross of the British canon still hangs from us. Look at it from one way, it can be quite delightful. And the younger writers wear it well and they are comfortable in many skins. They are more at ease with multiple cultural identities and they are skilled and well-read in the English language and use it as their chosen medium for expression as they adapt and subvert its literary traditions to reflect their own social context. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing one such writer, Ivy Niao, educated in Malaysia and the UK, and she's a shining example of this literary fusion. Her latest novel, The American Boyfriend, is a testament to her skill in blending mystery with the tapestry of multicultural voices. Her work spans from the UK into the dynamic backdrop of a rather folksy Florida, never falling between the cracks, always authentic. Ivy is our first author for Malaysia on this show, and I can't wait to have a conversation with her. And so to that end, she joins me from her home in London. Ivy Niao, welcome to the Literary City. Thank you so much, Ramji. Really excited to be on your show. Ivy Niao. Did I say that correctly? Yes, it's correct. Not just the Ivy, the other one too? Yes, the other one too. Yes. Thank you so much for getting it right. I mean, it's very unusual. You know what? I um, like the name of your blog, Right, Niao, Niao, N-G-E-O-W. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I thought that readers will just get that, whatever that is. They'll, they'll just get it. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Now, let yeah. me plunge in. Uh, I've read three of your books. The first one, Flying Rhino, and Overboard, and the latest book, The American Boyfriend. Clearly, you are not afraid of the dark. no. Yeah, probably um, enjoy being in the dark. All types of darkness. For example, you are quite comfortable with portraying deep moral ambiguity in your characters, aren't you? Yeah, I, I think that um, I'm interested in humanity mm -hmm. and the, the dark side of humanity too. Right. So um, I feel that they do go together and there's kind of a balance. It's like the yin-yang concept. Mm -hmm. We are not all great and we are not all bad either. Oh, all of us. So I think that readers do read into that and empathize with characters who are, who are full of flaws. Yes, I'm quite sure they do. And there's another peculiar aspect to your craft, and that is that you're able to weave in a non-linear narrative, but you make it look linear. You seem not to forget where you were in the story. I probably did when I was writing it, <laughs> but... Uh, we can fix that. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I think that writing multiple um, viewpoints um, is something really exciting for me. Um, maybe because it's also a bit like life. We can't always be doing laundry. We have to do something else. We have to work. We have to cook. So we, we tend to vary the pace of our day. And I feel that so that's natural to, uh, to a narrative. Uh, and the readers understand that, you know, after we follow this, um, this uh, viewpoint or train of thought, we switch to another and it carries on. And time is still moving on while the next one carries on. You know, I speak of the seamlessness of it all. Uh, Nonlinear writing is something to which a large number of writers aspire. Yeah. But not all of them get it right. So, so when I read a book and I encounter this, I always stop, rewind, mm. and try to find the connect. Yes. You seem to do that well. So tell me, was this a part of the development of yourself uh, and your craft as a writer? 
so when I, uh, I think that it's something that is available to you as a novelist, so it's, you're freer to do that. And I started writing short stories. So in short stories, there are very few characters. There are only two or three. And also there's a short amount of time in which the beginning, middle and end has got to happen. So there's, there's much, much uh, less uh, chances and also less risk of getting the narrative uh, wrong. Uh, and therefore, it's only a single viewpoint. Usually, I mean, most short stories are single viewpoint because there's no space. There's, there's no time to to get into other characters. So with, with I think, with multiple viewpoints, you get to really develop and explore a character. That's the whole point. Uh, and I started this technique um, probably more than 15 years ago when I was uh, doing my master's at Middlesex. And... Uh, you know, I was blown away when we had we when we had to um, experiment with. Uh, well, I mean, I call it experimenting, isn't it? Because we don't know what, where it's going to end up. So we had to experiment writing from like all sorts of viewpoints, from an old person, from a young African child. You know, for example, these are just examples. So there's there's so many viewpoints that we haven't even considered because as writers, obviously, all the characters come from us. We are all of them. Um, so to explore somebody else's character is um, very liberating. I mean, that's the whole point of creative writing. There's, there's a magic in it. You, you're making up something new, somebody that's totally new to you. Obviously, he's come from you, but you've made it up. Yeah, that's, it's, it's quite fascinating. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like to start with your, your novel, your, The uh, Cry of the Flying Rhino, was it? Yes. I, I like it. You know, they say that you mustn't judge books by their cover, but I certainly judge them by their openings. Yes. Right? Okay. And I'm a great fan of first lines and how the thing opens. And when I look at a book, I first read the opening. If somebody yes. is taking trouble over it. Yes, me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So let's yeah. see here. Flying Rhino. It starts with a line. Until I crashed my BMW into a rubber tree, I had not woken up. It's a sense of the dramatic, evident, but a little underplayed. And then your novel, Overboard, opens with terror in the water. Oh, yes. And The American Boyfriend opens with another sort of terror, Boyfriend Gone Wall. Yes, yes. Every, every, everybody's uh, um, worst fear. <laughs> yeah. And also a text message. I decided to start with a text message because oh, yeah. um, I was going to, uh, I was aiming to write something that, uh, People would just pick up and go, oh, what? You know, like, but, and we always read the text message. If you get a text message, it's going to go four words or three words where you will you always look it. at it. Like, what, what is it? What's right, it saying? Right. You know, what, what's happening? Right. So I wanted to open with a text message for a change. Yeah. Yeah, that is novel. And in all of these novels that I mentioned, your protagonist is always dropped in the middle of some terror that they have to cope. But the point is mm -hmm. that you always give them the inner strength to cope. So there's got to be something autobiographical about this. Yeah, so as as I was explaining, I think that it's really exciting that they they are all from you. So obviously all the characters, the cleaner, it's me. You know, I'm the, you know, main character. I'm the the minor character. So um so I guess what you know, what what I'm trying to say is that when you create like multiple characters and you put yourself into each of them, um, you've also got to put your own fears and conflicts in. Yeah, all your weaknesses too, the, your bad habits, you know, your strong points. And that's what makes them exciting because they, they will be unique. There's no one like you anyway. There's no one like, you know, any, any writer. You couldn't, even if I tried to be Stephen King or, you know, I, I wouldn't be because you, you know, um, it's something very, uh, very special, very, um, um, very part of, your identity and your your backdrop, you know, the stuff that you've read, the movies you've watched. Um, so each of those characters are going to be unique anyway. They, they are not going to be like uh, cardboard cutouts, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess not. And your readers aren't really looking to you for chiclet and rom-coms, are they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now let's talk a little about what I mentioned in the monologue. The sense of cultural and ethnic identity. And in your particular case, that would be uh, Malay, but of Chinese origin, correct? Yeah. Uh, synthesis, um, yeah. there's a word for that, isn't it? Malaysian Chinese. Right. 
But what's Piranakan? Oh, Piranakan is another, yeah, it's, you're, you're very, very um, sharp to point that out. I mean, that is uh, a race that uh, happened about 500 years ago uh, mm-hmm. when I believe um, a, a Malay uh, married a Chinese princess. And I mm-hmm. think they created their own uh, culture. And it's very strong and it's also called the Nyonya Baba culture. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a, it's a very strong melting pot of um, both the Malay and the Chinese. Yes, I've read a little about that, and it's expressed in art and culture and food and other stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And that identity is quite well celebrated, is it not? Yes, that's right. Yeah, in the there's a lot of Baranakan still. I mean, it's a it's a very um, I would say that it's probably shrinking because um, obviously they marry out and then uh, so, you know, the, their own culture shrinks. Um, it's a minority group in, but you see a lot of them where they originated in Malacca, Singapore and Penang. They are, you know, yeah. You say it's shrinking, but let me tell you where it's not shrinking. In Bangalore restaurant yes. menus, that's where. Oh, my goodness. I would love to. Oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So back to your writing, you lean on that um, ethnic identity, don't you? Yeah. But as a writer, don't you find yourself always looking at everything, including home, mm. with an outsider's perspective? Yes, I think that uh, it's. I think that's unavoidable for um, uh, writers uh, because you are an outsider. You're an insider and you're an outsider, right? So um, it's a really peculiar view, and I think it's like a. It's also like a movie director viewpoint because I always ask myself, how would you know Scorsese f- uh, um, frame this shot? How would David Lynch do it? And that's the same thing. Like they're in the shot, obviously they're there, but you don't know it because you're you're the audience. You're you're watching it at any one point in time. Only the director and the audience knows what's going on because the characters they are just acting out the story. They you know they are being moved around. And they don't know what the other one is thinking. So only you can view into the world at any point and as an outsider or insider. So you're in the frame, you're in view. And, and, and that's what's nice. You bring the reader in. You know, you can grab their attention when they're part of it, when they're emotionally involved in the scene. And we've all been there before. When we watch a movie or when you read a book, we are emotionally, we're involved. We're in that world. We can't get out. It's really annoying to stop watching and, you know, pause or whatever. And, you know, like, like oh, what? That. What do you want? Like, you know, you get really annoyed because you are inside. Yeah, it's true. Okay? I, I, can't, I can't stand that. Yeah, I can't stand that. Yeah. You know, let's talk about these cross-cultural things for a second over here. You grew up in, uh, in Malaysia, Johor Bahru. Is that yeah, right? Johor Bahru. Uh, been there briefly. I loved all of Malaysia. Oh, okay. Very few people say I love Johor Bahru. Well, I I don't know. I just went through Malaysia once, some many many years ago. Yeah. I was completely fascinated by all of it. Just oh, really? It. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to get back, but let's see. So you grew up in an English language milieu, mm-hmm. right? And as most of us post-colonial situations did, told me. So what? I imagine you grew up reading Shakespeare, other English writers, the poets. Oh, you know what? I I'm not much of a, the, a fan of the Bard, so right. I I grew up really enjoying like uh modern classics. I I like contemporary literature. I like modern stuff. So I mm-hmm. modern for the time, obviously when I was growing up. So right. I I I I really enjoyed like uh American modern uh, writers like mm-hmm. Harper Lee, uh sure. Ernest Hemingway, and I I love the UK ones like George Orwell, and I. I enjoyed Grand Green. And then later on, I was reading Martin Amos, all the stuff that people, everybody else was reading, like in the you know, 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, we had the same bedside table books, clearly. Yeah, clearly, yeah. <laughs> so those are, you know, formative for me. And I, I enjoy sort of a modern storytelling as well. So um, I found it hard. I mean, obviously, we had to do Dickens and Shakespeare at school and stuff. But course, I, I still feel uh, I feel like I'm a contemporary person. Right, right. I can see that. And then you said that you went to England for your master's, Middlesex for your master's mm-hmm. degree. What was the transition like? Did your inner Jane Austen find her outer Jane Austen? Or did something change? So I uh, went to uh, Middlesex thinking that 
uh, well, it's English, right? So I thought that I'm supposed to be, you know, Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, uh, I'm, you know, Virginia Woolf. I thought that I'm going to be writing stuff like that. So I started writing from, uh, um, I've always been trying to write or, you know, you know, being used to writing in a white male middle class middle age perspective. I thought this is me. I'm <laughs> I'm actually you know deep down white male middle class middle middle aged, and I'm very comfortable writing in it. And then people say, I don't understand this. Why you know you know where does this voice come from? I said, Well, it's come from me. It's called creative writing. You know, um, <laughs> that's funny. And then I I at Middlesex, you know, that's why I said that I I learned a lot about the viewpoints then because I realized that you can be any of them. You could. You could be any any of them. You could be, yeah, right. you know, young, female, white, or black, or you know, you could be anyone because you're a writer. You you put those characters together. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I stopped doing that 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 perspective. But happily, you're not uncomfortable writing as yourself either. Yeah, thanks very much, and I'm glad I have that maturity behind me. And I'm actually no, I don't regret writing as a you know white middle age. Uh, male or whatever because i feel that it's it's brought me to where i am today what what's it like back home though but when you, let's talk about english language writing in mm -hmm. malaysia or that or the region for instance so what, what are the challenges to writing the english language in uh, southeast asia let's say i think in southeast asia is a very niche concept but the, it's very vibrant i mean i've just been back from a, a southeast asian book mm -hmm. tour and i was really blown away by the reception in southeast asia they love books and writers mm -hmm. i mean there, there it's definitely uh, clearly something that um people really enjoy it's uh you know it's a an entertainment mm -hmm. for them Speaking of which, there have been quite a few excellent English language writers from Malaysia. Yeah. Any of them inspire you? Um, I read Catherine Lim because I was very interested. She, she wrote oh, yeah. only short stories. And mm -hmm. uh, they were all sort of based on like, uh, you know, childhood uh, in Asia, like sort of that kind of a uh, sepia tinted sort of vintage view of uh, life growing up in an old Malaysia oh, Malaya, mm -hmm. you know, all all mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Singapore and all Asia, and like, uh, lots of legends and ghost stories, and you know, there's always a grandma, like probably in every scene, there's there's some grandma, you know. So I, uh, you know, I think that I really, I mean, I did devour all her books when I was growing. I really enjoyed, um, and also like, I I enjoyed books from the region. Like, um, I think they were published by Macmillan or somebody. But anyway, there were a series. There was like. Stories from Indonesia, stories from India, uh, stories from Pakistan. So I, I sort of grew up reading. I didn't realize this, but it was like it's all under the same thing, like world literature. But I, I mean, at that time, I just thought, hey, these are really good stories because it's got both, uh, you know, the heritage side. Uh, it's got like the heritage of those countries, those places. It's got a bit of language from the, from them. It's got the characters, but it's universal. They speak to me because I find that, um, you know stories they they bring us together because we're we're more similar than we're not that is so true but then again there are the local pressures for example in uh, in in the region what about the younger writers is there a pressure to become more local for instance put more singlish into the writing and what would you say to that uh, for local writers, I think that discovering their own voice is more important than the pressure of uh, writing in patois or colloquialism, uh, because that that comes. I think it's important to test your own voice as a writer, because obviously there's many there's many there's many voices. You could do any voice. That's great. The advice. aim should be to write the best thing that you could ever write. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. And and what about diaspora literature? Is there a is there a marked movement? Is there any upswing in? What do you see yourself as? Are you see yourself as diaspora or a local lass? Uh, that's an interesting question. I I think I would still I I identify as a diaspora writer because I find that it comes in no matter um, what I'm writing. I feel that it's I I feel that it matters to represent the world that we live in now. Okay, so even in UK, if you go to a hospital, if you're anytime sick, there is nobody uh, that you will meet who will be from the same country. You know, you will have the nurses from India, uh, Philippines, Nigeria. I mean, the, the staff are from everywhere in the world. You know, Portuguese right, doctors, right. 
and so on. I mean, the thing is, uh, if you if you don't write about that, you are choosing to ignore the world that we live in now. Sure. And completely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that. Then let's talk about let's talk about humor for a minute. You know that uh, from all the stuff that I've seen, I, I find a lot of uh, Chinese writing, Chinese movies, even the bloodiest kung fu movies, are very often very it's funny. It's got to be funny, yeah. Yeah, yeah it has got to be funny. funny. There's always a sense of funny over there. What? Mm. So you must have grown up in a milieu of humor, yes. Because there is that comes into your writing every now and again. Yeah. Dark humor. I think dark humor is very is very Asian, and <laughs> it is very Asian. I don't know any Asians who are not darkly humorous. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it's the way we are, and it's the way our grandmothers are. Because our, you, there's the grandmother, the grandmother again. again, right? There's always the uh, Asian mom or grandmothers, and they are they are very funny. They are like mm. you know, even if you hate them and they're irritating, but they'll be funny. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. It's so true. It's so true. People, people think that's my God. That's her. I know her. That that character. I know she. She's my mom. You know. So um... <laughs> delightful. All right. Let's move on now to the uh, to the book at hand, the American Boyfriend, uh, Key West, Florida. Interesting choice of location. Um, I wanted the setting that uh, readers could recognize as um vaguely asian it's in america but i've been there before and it really reminded me of home it's very it's tropical and it has storms and huge roads and highways and stuff you know and um uh it, it's got the seaside and it's a little bit sparsely uh populated as well so um it's something that was familiar and it was also I wanted to think of a place that was so different for, from London, so different that she's totally gripped by the idea of going there and must go there no matter what. Um, because as you've been to London, it's dirty, cold, grey, expensive. I think those are the four <laughs> words my mom used. Yeah, so so it was. it's a contrast, isn't it, to Florida? I mean, you've been to Florida too. Yeah. Yeah, and now in your book, there's a there's a part where your character Phoebe says something about Florida to her boyfriend Carter. It slips my mind right now, but it goes to how weird Florida is. Oh yeah, where the weird GoPro. Where the weird GoPro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that one. Did you make it up? Is it a known yeah. phrase? I actually don't know. I mean, I think that I must have heard it somewhere. Like I must have seen it on a bumper sticker when I was there or something because it came back like all fully formed where the weird GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about imagery. There's this short story of yours yeah. that I read. It's called Under the Fig Tree. Oh, yes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I, amazing. You found that story. Yeah. Now, in that story, yeah. there's a phrase that you repeat, and it goes like this. It's so black, it's blue. I'm oh, yeah. sure that's a metaphor. Explain that metaphor to me. Uh, when something is very black, it doesn't reflect any more light. Okay. It, is, it absorbs. Right, yes. So what you see is actually a reflection of your eyes, the, the, the blueness. Ah, I get it. All right, cool. Let's talk about you for a minute. Yeah. On page 77 of The American Boyfriend, there's this. The modernist open plan was conducive and practical for childcare. You could see oh, the child from anywhere in the house. So this yeah. is your architect designer self coming through? Yes, uh, that might, yeah, that, so I, uh, that house was actually modeled on one of the, the, the layouts that I've designed. So I thought, oh, you know, this is such a good, this is a good, good, interesting, um, uh, you know, backdrop to the story uh, because of the open plan. Yeah. Clearly, you always harbor the sense of uh, excitement and drama in what you do. You could tell that from your social media videos, and you could also tell that from the reading that you did from your novel uh, when we started this podcast, <laughs> right? You seem like a natural-born performer. Now, would you say that writing to you is a performance art? I think somebody once said that writing is a uh showbiz for shy people <laughs> showbiz for shy people yeah couldn't tell that you're a shy person <laughs> <laughs> also from your social media i picked up this 
tweet, I think, that you had done, which said, yeah. basically, please to share that my novel, The American Boyfriend, has been acquired by Penguin. Uh, if I sell zero or maybe 10 copies of The American Boyfriend, it's still very special to me as I grew up reading the orange paperbacks. Yeah, all right. Oh, gosh, yeah. You, you remember the whole tweet. I can't believe it. Sort of, but I kind of enjoyed yeah. uh, the vulnerability in there as a writer. And I certainly hope that more than 10 people <laughs> buy your book. Yeah. Yeah, yes, thank you so much. That I mean, that's that's an amazing recommendation. And I think as writers, it's very humbling because you never know if only your mum is going to read it, <laughs> right? So there's always that terrible fear. And it's I know it's irrational because it's out on Penguin. So it's, it, maybe your mum won't read it. You know, maybe uh, other people read it. So I, it's, it's something that uh, will come through to you all the time as, as a writer, you know, you know your audience. Because you write for an audience. So according to you, yeah. if you really want a brutal critic, you should ask somebody else's grandma. Oh, good idea. So what's the next project? So I'm working on another thriller, and I'm hoping to set it in uh, London and Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it's, it's about uh, an Asian family in London. And I can't say much more except that it's go going to have a mind-blowing twist. So I, I, I'm really excited, and I'm working on... Uh, you know, structuring that right now. Well, once it's done, you should tell me about it. Maybe we can have you back here on the show. Thank you so much. And I, and yeah, I hope you will like it. You'll definitely be receiving a copy to read. Oh, please make sure that I do. I'm sure that I'm going to enjoy it. As much as I enjoyed this, it's been wonderful talking to you. Ivy Niao, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you so much, Ranjit. Really enjoyed it. I really appreciate this. And I hope you're your audience enjoys the show too. You've been listening to the wonderful Ivy Niao, author of the thriller, The American Boyfriend. And there's a link in the podcast description to where you can buy that book. And I'll be back with that fun segment, What's That Word? Where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about. Right after this... Here we are again. This is What's That Word? And here she is, my co-host. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. How's your weekend doing? You know, I can't really tell work days from weekends because of the nature of the work we do, right? Yeah, so true. But my friends have a more structured work environment. Mm -hmm. You know, they go to an office every morning. Ah, uh, my sympathies to them. <laughs> Hey, they listen to podcasts on their commute, one in particular. I never said that they weren't super smart. <laughs> well, anyway, while we can have fun and go out more, the one thing that we share is that a long weekend can become very dull, you know, because it keeps you from being productive. Yeah, it's that's true. It could get very boring. And I'm sensing that this is where I should ask you, What's that word? <laughs> what gave it away? I'm just that perceptive. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> okay, so here's what I want to discuss. But uh, before that, I totally enjoyed your conversation with Ivy Meow. She's fun. You know, I, I liked her novel. Yeah, I'm going to buy it after this. Oh, you love it. And you refer to Peranakan culture. Mm -hmm. You remember I wrote about Peranakan food. Of course I do. And you've also traveled all over Southeast Asia. I assume you're familiar with the literature? Yes. Uh, everywhere I travel, I must read a local writer. Yeah. So which one from your Southeast Asia travels? Well, recently in Singapore, I picked up a book called There's uh -huh. No Such Thing as a Skinny Bibik by uh -huh. Sandra Chia. And there was a more serious one, The State of Emergency by Jeremy Tiang. Do you enjoy them? Really. Did and now, Ivy Now Next. Cool, that's cool. All right, back to what's that word? Right. So my girlfriend and I d were discussing how much nicer it would be if the offices weren't all closed. And she mm -hmm. used this expression, yes, I'm sitting here doing nothing. It's like watching paint dry. <laughs> that's funny, but apt. 
Yeah, so I know the phrase means a situation or activity that is dull, boring or tedious. Right. So here's an example. Mm-hmm. I'd rather stick my head in the toilet than watch paint dry. <laughs> stick your head in the toilet. <laughs> now, that's what one does after a particularly non-boring activity, isn't it? <laughs> Only when I can get my friend to hold my hair. <laughs> Funny, that was quick. <laughs> so, watching paint dry, is this an interesting phrase? Yes, it is. Interesting because this phrase originally described an exciting activity. Watching paint dry was an exciting activity? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and where was this? The Society of Masochists? <laughs> <laughs> France, <laughs> other places. Okay, I'm very intrigued. Now the etymology, please. All right. So the origins of the interesting aspects of this phrase lie in a French word called vernissage. What's vernissage? Literally, it means varnishing. But this word is better understood in the art industry as a private opening for an upcoming art show, you know, like a private preview, if you like. So Mm -hmm. a vernissage is a private preview of an art show. And here's the connect. Back in the 19th century, before a show opened, artists would use varnish on their works, you know, to protect the delicate paint from damage. And also the varnish enhanced, and I I guess it uh, consolidated the drying process. Now, typically varnishing day or vernissage would be the day prior to the formal opening of the exhibition. And it was also done for the tradition of uh, celebrating the completion of an artwork or a series of artworks, you know, with friends and sponsors and so on. So this generally caused a lot of excitement in people, understandably. Now, connect the two. It means that all these excited people were at the show when the varnish had been applied. And so these excited patrons were standing about quite literally... (laughs) Watching the paint dry. (laughs) Yes, you got it. (laughs) Your description of this is so exciting. But tell me, how did the phrase come to meet quite the opposite? Right, I look for it. I, I couldn't find anything related, I presume, because it's a fairly obvious association. But I did find out how someone put that boring version of the phrase to a rather exciting use. Really? Pray tell. Yes. In 2016, you know, film director Charles Shackleton released a 10-hour and 7-minute long film of paint drying. Guess the title of this film. Paint drying? Yes. That was the title, Paint Drying. <laughs> what? Why? You see, he did that to protest against the rule that the British Board of Film Classification needed to approve films. Now, he found out that board members charged per minute for their mandatory service. So the board had to watch the whole film, all 10 hours and 7 minutes of it, to be able to classify it. And you know what the bill was? The bill was £5,936 sterling. (laughs) Oh, gosh. And what certificate did they give it? You, universal. (laughs) Quite amazing. All this is not helping my friend sitting on her couch and staring at the walls. She'll find out differently when she hears this episode. She's going to have to find another less exciting phrase to describe her boredom, I guess. Watching the grass grow? (laughs) Waiting for your package from China? (laughs) Watching a snail wade through molasses? (laughs) Waiting for your Uber driver? (laughs) Stop. Stop. But that's exactly what I'm going to be doing next. What? Getting an Uber to go see my friend. And we're going out to the pub. There. She'll hold your hair for you when you stick your head in the toilet, just to keep from watching paint dry. Hey, that works for me. Bye. And that is our show. Thank you so much for listening, for being here. I'd like to thank my guest, Ivy Niao, and my co-host, Pranati P. with an A. Madhav. And you, for those wonderful comments, please keep them coming. And hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, show us some love. Till I see you again next time, this is Ramji Chandran, and this is The Literary City. Literary City
Thank you.